Hey, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to another amazing uh, online AMA talk here. Uh, my name is Colin Giles, the head of the School for Animation and Visual Effects here at Vancouver Film School. I'm assuming a good chunk of you know me because you're either in my class or skipping my class uh, <laughs> or, or you've been in one of my classes and gave me a bad review or whatever, <laughs> bought me an apple at some point. I appreciate that. Um, welcome everybody. We've got quite a few people coming in, so we're just going to give some folks. Yeah, we can um, tap dance for a while. Yeah. At least I assume you can tap dance. Mile into our virtual room. All right, yeah. Um, Great to have everybody here. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, our guest of honor this evening is um, just an amazing guest, and we really appreciate him taking the time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Musker, uh, director, animator, producer, of some films you may have heard of through your travels if you're an animation fan. Uh, the Great Mouse Detective, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, Treasure Planet, which has an interesting development story, uh, and Moana. And now uh, a great production called Retirement, which we'll talk about. Yes, later. right, right. It's a, it, yeah, it's, it's in 70 millimeter and it's, and it's uh, runs, hopefully it will run for a while. We'll see if it has legs or not. I don't know if Retirement has legs. Got it's like, but they're, they're weak and arthritic, so that's you know right. it's, uh, that's the way it goes. You got to have a big opening weekend. That's no no pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, big big opening weekend, or then they they shut the rest down, and we wouldn't want that to happen. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. they shut your Vimeo link down, and your your shorts dead. Right. Off. Yes. Yeah. I see some great chat going on. Nice to see everyone. Hey, just a little bit of housekeeping right down in the middle there. Uh, this is not like class. This is way more better organized than any of my classes. There's a Q and A button down there, so feel free to click on that Q&A, type in your question, and we will get you um, if, it's a, if it's a really great question. So think of some really great questions um, for John. John's done, this is probably what, the third interview you've done in your career? So I'm sure you're a little nervous. I have done a few and I've, I've bored people in, in many languages. So yes, I, it's, uh, <laughs> this will be added to the, the wall of shame. No, I'm, I'm delighted to be, I, I, as I was telling Colin, I, I, I may have seen some of you for that matter, I came to, the Spark Festival a couple of years ago. I can't remember. Yeah. Three years ago, Keith Blackmore organized. It was fun. And I think we, I spoke at, what is it? Not, not Emily Carpenter. There's another school, isn't there? Or it wasn't Emily Capilano Carpenter. and Emily, you were at, 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 at Emily Carr to do your talk. For yeah. Spark. And then, yeah, you came by the uh, school. You I, came, I think I signed the wall there and yeah. uh, I drew something. I think I might've drawn Sebastian. Sebastian. I think Sebastian, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right yeah. in the middle there. It was great. Yeah. I think Keith was directing me to, uh, do something like that. So I did. Yeah. Yeah. I think he, he basically forced you to. So we appreciate that. Yeah. Flew all the was, way to draw. Well, it, was fun, it was a fun trip. I was saying it was a, you know, a beautiful weather. I heard today was a, a nor'easter on the West coast somehow. And uh, it was very violent weather today, sort of. And it was a little yeah. crazy here. Yeah. It was a little wild. Not, not the usual thing. I, I thought Vancouver is kind of the LA of Canada, isn't it? Or no? Yeah. <laughs> Is there such a yeah, no, that's what we like to think of ourselves. Yeah, Hollywood North, except with lots of mudslides and yeah, uh, mudslides and, and, and crazy and hockey. Uh, and hockey. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know how the Canucks are doing, but yeah, okay. Uh, we won't talk about that. Okay, all right, all right. We won't, we don't need Mark is already upset as it is. He doesn't need to know about his own hockey team. I did see the Canucks play the Kings a couple of years ago. I went to the, you know, here with some other Hockey enthusiasts. And we, yeah, and there you go. Fun, yeah. It's uh, LA Kings guaranteed win night when the Canucks come to town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe the Kings did win that one, but I can't remember. Awesome. Well, I know there's a, a class or a theater of people right now. Um, I believe, Mark, you're hosting that. So thank you, Mark, for being there. Uh, just we're, we're getting all these inside jokes about Mark Pudliner, who's our senior classical instructor, uh, just a great person, an amazing artist in his own right. Uh, and it, uh, had the honor of working uh, with and for John for many years. Yes, he worked. He was a wonderful animator, and uh, Mark uh, worked particularly with uh, Ken Duncan on the character of Meg and Hercules. Mark did some wonderful scenes of Meg, very, you know, uh, sarcastic as Meg would be. And uh, as Mark isn't, he had we had to explain what sarcasm was to him because he doesn't use sarcasm in his daily life normally. But uh, uh, no, he was he great. He was great. He was fantastic draftsman. I know he had been wonderful years he spent for with uh, Don Bluth doing you know various things for him and. Uh, uh, yeah, we enjoyed working with him. I'm, I think you're very lucky to have him as a teacher and as a part of the whole program there. And he also has a talented son, son uh, Matthew Pudline. So if he's there in the audience today, Matthew, hello, uh, good luck, and uh, and say hello to your father in person for me. That's right. He's great, too. And runs in the family. Um, 
Well, thank you, John, for taking some time out of your uh, busy retirement schedule. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, actually, well, my big my big thing right now is I'm awaiting the the birth of my third granddaughter. My hey. son, I have twin sons, and one of them who is married uh, has two and you know two and seven eighths children. Whatever. I mean, basically, this one was <laughs> due a few days ago. This his third daughter. Uh, and so she's a few days late at this point, uh, but I'm always late. So I figured that runs in the family. So there you go. It's a so, it, so, so if I get a phone call in the middle of this and, and you know, I'm boiling hot water in the background, you'll know what's happening. <laughs> it's time to go. And I'll just cover the rest. I'll just talk. Uh, about you can cover the rest. Right? I'll take it from here. Awesome. Well, we wanted to talk uh, to you, well, you know, generally with these, um, I like to get into a couple of bit of narratives here, uh, but the first is just a sort of a general, I, I, you know, a, a lot of the people that are in attendance today are of a younger ilk, uh, even younger than me, and which is not hard to be. And I know a lot of folks uh, are big fans of Moana, and that's kind of like where your Disney journey ended. But let's go back to the beginning, because what I find interesting is um, your sort of uh, college education was, you know, not the traditional CalArts Sheridan type, you know, Ringling uh Oh, it was that sort of. <laughs> you, went to, you went to Northwestern. You oh, I did to go to Northwestern. Yeah. I did. I, I went to, uh, I'm from Chicago, uh, home of the Blackhawks for you hockey fans, but the Blackhawks, are, they've had various troubles. But um, yeah, I grew up in Chicago. I'm proud to be a, a Chicago person. Um, I went to school at Northwestern University, which is in Evanston, the suburb of Chicago. And I majored in English literature there at school. So I, I got a degree, but actually, I, part of the reason I did that was uh, I had gone to this Jesuit high school, the same school that Bill Murray went to in Chicago, Loyola Academy, all guys school. Do they have those in Canada? I don't know anymore. Maybe Somewhere. not. But yeah. Uh, so all guys Catholic school. We had to wear coats and ties, you know, this is the 60s and whatever. And um, and then I uh, I had there was this one priest who said, <laughs> ironically, said, you don't zero in too quickly when you get to post high school years and your college years get a broad humanities background that will serve you well in whatever you happen to do. And I thought that was kind of possibly true because I was thinking I was going to go into some art related field and particularly cartooning related field. I was interested in, you know, editorial cartooning and comic books and animation and yada, yada, yada. And I somehow felt that, well, a lot of that was self-taught anyway. So I thought being a little lazy guy that I am, I thought, well, this will help me if I'm, if I major in English, it will force me to read the great books that otherwise I might let slip and slide and all that. So that's what I did. So I spent three and a half years. I had some AP credits, so I got out after three and a half years. <clears throat> and I majored in English and I read Shakespeare and uh, Chaucer and Dickens and uh, Nabokov and all sorts and Hemingway and all sorts of people. And it was great. And I'll, But I also got to take other classes which worked have worked well in my career and that I, uh, I had, had film history classes, you know, where we saw the great films, you know, uh, live action films and kind of pick them apart. And uh, and I got to take art history classes. So I learned, you know, who Giotto was and about the uh, expressionists and the Renaissance and all these things that really, uh, I, I love that class. Um, anyway, though, so I, when I got out though, then I was thinking, well, now I'm gonna, while I was there, I heard that Disney had a training program uh, and I had gotten reinterested in animation. As a kid, I was thinking I might want to be an animator. And then I drifted away a little bit from that, but as I was, getting more serious about a career, I was thinking about that. I had been filmmaking also too. I'd been doing Super 8 films with my friends. I did a feature like Super 8 film and uh, bridging sort of from high school and, and while I was at Northwestern, I did this film that we didn't know how long it was gonna be and I was writing it as we were making it. So it wound up being feature length and it was insane. And it took us, it was like an animated feature. It took like three and a half years to make and we, we finally had to finish it because our leading man, he was going off to college himself. He was three years younger than we were, three, four years younger than we were. So we finished it. Anyway, I, uh, I heard Disney had a training program for animation. And I thought, hey, that's something I was interested in. I put together a portfolio. They said that's what they wanted, drawings of animals and people. And uh, I uh, my port sent the portfolio off to them, went to the Disney Review Board, and it got rejected. <laughs> and uh, that was unfortunate. Of course, I told the story, and probably some of these people in this audience have heard my story. It's one of my go-to stories, but bear with me. I, uh, it, in order to put together the portfolio, I, who am of Irish extraction and in my own stereotypical way, I feel like every Irish person I know is allergic to everything. And so uh, I was, so my mother was allergic to all animals. We never had any animals around the house. When I had to draw animals, I thought, what am I going to do? I went to the Lincoln Park Zoo. It was February. I went there and I drew the poor freezing monkeys and I was freezing and it was miserable and they were miserable. I was miserable. I said, wait a minute, the Field Museum of Natural History. I'll go there. I'll draw the dioramas 
and I will have drawings of animals. So I did that, put them on my foil, sent it off to Disney. And then when I got rejected by Disney, as I did, they, they said, uh, your animal drawings are too stiff. <laughs> and I said, stiff, they were stuffed. They could not possibly be stiffer than what I saw. Um, but I was like, yeah, that didn't work out. And then I, I sent a portfolio to Marvel Comics. I drew a Daredevil page, a Spider-Man page, a mystery page. I got rejected by them too. And I'm like, this whole thing of not using, you know, of using colleges probably is not working at all. But, uh, but it, it sort of came through in that I got a further letter that said, maybe you want to send this portfolio to CalArts. We have a new character animation program. It was the first year of the program in 1975, uh, September of 75. So I thought, I swore I would never go to graduate school, but I said, I will do this and just see what happens. I sent them the portfolio, I got accepted. I said, I'll go there for a year and who knows. And it was taught by Disney veterans, great, some great people, Amor Plummer, T. He, Ken O'Connor, the great Bill Moore, who was a design teacher who had come from Chouinard, the kind of art school that fed a lot of the animation industry through the 30s, 40s and 50s, you know, and it was a private little art school in LA. Uh, Nelbert Chouinard was her name, the woman who kind of ran the school. Anyway, um, so I went uh, to CalArts and I got great instruction. And at the end of that first year at CalArts, they suddenly said, we're gonna have a, a showing for the Disney Review Board, put all your drawings up on the wall and we're gonna show our animation test. We had no idea that was gonna happen. And so I put my animation test in there and I put my drawings on the wall and they came and saw and they liked my work and they offered me a job, not realizing that I was the person that they rejected a year before. And uh, <laughs> so I made sure that they knew that. I said, are you sure you really know? I, I, I was, and so I wound up the long story long, I, I then uh, worked as an intern at Disney for a summer, working with the great Eric Larson, one of the nine old men mm -hmm. who animated on Bambi and, and uh, Snow White. He was an animal expert and a bird expert, great avuncular teacher, mentor to an entire generation at Disney. He was in charge of the little training program. So I went back to CalArts for another year. And then after that year, I came in. I started at Disney officially the week. And for all of you younger people, there was a time when Star Wars debuted in the theater long before any of you were born. But that, <laughs> that was the week I started Disney, at least domestically. I don't know the Canadian release, but uh, it debuted on March uh, 25th in 1977. And I started at Disney on March 23rd, 1977. So I was on Monday, Wednesday, the movie opened in Westwood, you know, sort of the movie Mecca at the time. And they didn't open it in the Kajillion theaters in the day because they wanted to build up lines and get buzz, a whole different release pattern. But I went to see it later that week with uh, various Disney geeks who knew more about it than I did. I'm like, what is this, Star Wars? I don't know. And, and, I, and I loved it. I mean, I was amazed by it, but I hadn't known what was coming, sort of. So anyway, so then I, and then somehow I spent 40 years at Disney. End of story. <laughs> End of story. Yeah, just that little gap there. Right. <laughs> yeah. And 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 it uh, it's my understanding you also, you know, were, were mentored by other nine old men as well. <clears throat> but what a time to start at Disney at that time, just with some incredible... It was a miraculous bit of timing on my part that I had nothing to do with. But um, the reason it worked out that way partly was because, you know, literally most of those guys were born around 1913 or so, and they were all in their 60s and they're getting ready to retire. And Disney had not been expanding the ranks of animators, you know, during the uh, 50s and 60s, they were downsizing, if anything, the, the staff was sort of shrinking. And Walt Disney never really even planned for beyond his own life, really. He didn't think about what would happen to animation. And he kind of sub subsided his passion for animation, which was huge in the 30s. It got tested severely in the 40s with the strike and with diminishing markets because of the war and having to make training films. And then the 50s, the parks came along and the TV show and his interest kind of moved in that direction. So animation was still almost like a pastime for him. So it wasn't as aggressively pursued. Well, Disney died in 1966. And then in 1967, Jungle Book came out and it was a huge hit. And so the people who were in charge of Disney at the time said, whoa, we, we should keep this going. This is a good thing. But all our animators are 64 years old, you know, and so we need to develop talent. And yet they, they weren't likely to hire people, they really wanted to groom people and teach them the Disney way and whatnot. So they, they would almost rather hire art students than people from other animation studios because right. they felt like the approach was different. So they really started this aggressive in-house training program under Eric Larson. But Frank and Ollie were still there. Milk Call had just retired. Milk Call, when I was at, for those of you who don't know Milk Call, one of the great animators at Disney, when I was at CalArts that first year, uh, he came and talked at the school and he was just about to retire. He had just finished working on The Rescuers with Medusa. And so we recorded this thing. If you've seen uh, Clay Cadis's, uh, he's got a blog and he put it on his blog, I think, but literally 
I recorded it on my little cassette recorder and, and I transcribed it. And then Nancy Beeman, who uh, taught at Sheridan for a number of years, yeah. uh, typed it up and you know we distributed it to everybody. It was great hearing Milt, very iconoclastic, uh, uh, curmudgeon sort of, but one of the greatest animators of all time. And he showed some footage from Rescuers that was going to be coming. And, and so we did have various uh, speakers while I was in CalArts, like we're doing here a little bit, but um, Daryl Van Sitters really helped pull people in. Jack was a little shaky on doing it. Jack Hannon in charge of the program, but um, he did invite Chuck Jones came and spoke and, uh, wow. and uh, but we had people like Mike Law and uh, and Mike Maltese, the great Warner Brothers story man, who I, yeah. I feel so lucky to have heard him talk. And we had Maurice Noble, the great designer, a lot of Warner's people and uh, MG, some MGM people and stuff like that. And I had heard Richard Williams speak uh, before I got to CalArts at the Chicago yeah. Film Festival. And he was very much an influence on me in a way and just in terms of his just he, he, he if any of you who worked for Dick or whatever you know how you know he's a maniac. I mean he's just sort of just he lived and breathed animation and to an insane degree. Uh, who else would spend twenty five years on one film? Um, <laughs> but he came to the Chicago Film Festival when I was a student at Northwestern. And I went down to the festival and they had a retrospective of all his work. And they were but they were showcasing uh, the Christmas Carol, the Christmas featurette that he had just finished for ABC. And uh, it was amazing to see this thing, you know, drawn in the style of the illustrations of Dickens back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then he did a Q and A, uh, and it was, and people were raising that, "Can I come work for you?" And he was, uh, 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 you know, and <laughs> trying to sidestep those questions. But I did, after I got out of Northwestern, then when I went on a little three week uh, vacation before I was going to face the real world with uh, my best friend Rick, and we went to England, and I just kind of cold called the Williams Studio, and I went to visit the studio, having seen him at this thing, and. And so the, the girl, the British girl, you know, yes, I suppose you can come by, right? You know, and so we, you know, we just kind of showed up and they had somebody show us around. We saw Dick on a stairway looking at some stuff. We never really talked to him, but we talked to a few of the, I, mean, I think we talked to Tony White back in the day and some other people and uh, and it was it was fun. And it, so that helped move me in that direction uh, further of maybe I should think of this animation thing as, a, as an actual livelihood. Yeah. I mean, talk about the difference in visiting studios. I think I, when I was at Pixar, they scanned my face and my genetic code like six times to get in there. And yeah, yeah. The day, you could just walk in for a beer. I know. Well, and we, I, there are people who used to, even people who applied at Disney and they dropped their portfolio off like Bernie Manson years ago, I think, but with the, the security guard in the front, he just hit you. Want, oh, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, give it to me. And, you know, and there was, it was very, you know, a very small operation. Even when I started at Disney, I think the whole animation department was maybe like 200 people, you know, I mean, it was just so small. And then I, you know, and I just saw Nightmare Before Christmas, they did the live concert with Danny Elfman and Billie Eilish at the, the soccer stadium in LA near USC. Yeah. And I, you know, I hadn't seen it for a while and I love it. And I, you know, I friend of Henry Selix, but uh, I was amazed how few animators animated on that thing. I'm like, how did they do that movie? They had like 15 animators. I'm like, what the heck, how did they do that? So like, cause, we got to a point, you know, we, in our early films, certainly even on Fox now, that there, I don't know, maybe there were 20 animators. By the time we did even Hercules, though, because it was compressed schedule spread out, I think we had like 80 animators. And then by Moana, I mean, we had so, I, we probably again had eight, I don't know if we had like around 80 again or something. And it's hard to keep that many people at work while the story is changing and all that. It's sort of a, it can be a nightmare in production, but uh, it's a different world than when I started. Yeah. But I, I think it's a better world in the sense that, uh, there are more studios producing animation. There's certainly a lot more animation programs, such as your own. And maybe, maybe it was around in the '70s. I don't know, but it's yeah. like, uh, you know, there's a lot of schools that have strong programs and good teachers and and online learning. You know, even if you don't want to go to a university, there's good you know animation mentor type things that you can really yeah. learn uh, animation that way. So that's a, that's a cool thing for young. You youngsters in the audience, uh, uh. and your your class. Well, in the classes around you at CalArts, there was there was a quite a few people that were uh, that would be very. There were yeah. There's a lot of people that went up to so in, the, in my class, which was the first year. Nancy Beeman was in my class, and um, Jerry Reese was in my class. Who uh, did Brave Little Toaster? John Laster was in the class. Who so something you know? I think he went on to other things. Um, Brad Brad Bird was in our class. Uh, and uh, Daryl Van Sitters, who's got Renegade Animation down here. And then one year behind us was uh, Tim Burton mm -hmm. and uh, Chris Buck, who just you know did Frozen, Mike Giamo, great art director, and, uh, and the list goes on and on. And yeah, so it became really very much kind of a feeder school. And they, you know, Vanity Fair did a piece where they took a picture of, you know, Pete Doctor and Andrew Stanton and, and John and uh, a ton of people that Mark Andrews and people that 
all came through Cal. It's A113, which you, know, A113. you, you see in various movies. That's the room where we learned animation. And we we really did. I don't know how it is in your program, but in our program, the art, the animation part of it, <laughs> um, Jack didn't really teach. He wasn't really an animator for most of his career. He was a director and he was a uh, kind of a story man kind of a thing and gag guy. So he didn't teach the technique of animation particularly. So we learned that more by getting lessons from each other. I mean, Brad Bird knew something about animation. He, he went and when he was 11 years old, he was working on a film, The Tortoise and the Hare, and he came down to the Disney studio from his home in Oregon. And he was doing scenes on paper. And Daryl Van Sitters, likewise, in New Mexico, uh, had worked for Bandelier Studios, a little small studio. And so they knew stuff about animation. So we would show our tests to each other. It was very collegial and collaborative. And people would give you notes, you know, and ideas. Or no one, there was no dictatorial thing. Ever, but it, everybody was working on their own little film. But you'd show it to people and get some feedback. And, uh, and it really was helpful in terms of animation itself. The other things, uh, design and stuff like that, layout. Ken O'Connor was a wonderful teacher. Bill Moore was a wonderful teacher. But animation was kind of uh, gleaned from the other students and from your own. I had my little Super 8 viewer. This is, I'm telling you, kids, this was before VHS. It was, there was VHS alone. There was nothing digital, no Vimeo, no nothing, no YouTube, forget about. So, so literally, I had a little Super 8. You know, they did these cut downs of Disney features on Super 8. Super 8, it's a film strip. It's this big. Um, so I had my little viewer and I, I literally, I still have it. I have a notebook. I went through Snow White and Pinocchio and I, I broke down Bill Titler scenes and I did the little diagrams and timing notes and, and I created my own little primer of, uh, uh, and I was doing that while I was at Cal Arts as well, just sort of, you know, looking at the scenes and trying to figure out what, how did they get, oh, here it is at regular speed now. What is the frame for? Oh, so that's how they did this. this is how they anticipated this and these are the change of shapes that they did and how they, you know, they resolve this. And it, it really was uh, helpful for me to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I was in school, we got a laser disc player. Ah, yeah, yeah. We could, we could do really nice frame grabs. Yeah, really. Yeah, still frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah Let's break down scenes from Pocahontas yeah. and stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And you're, the first film you worked on at Disney was uh, The Fox and the Hound, which was actually the first film I ever saw in a movie theater when I was. Well, actually, the first film I worked on at the studio was technically was the small one, a Christmas feature that was directed by Don Bluth. Uh, half hour long uh, Christmas story. That was a tortured story. And I won't go into it in great detail here because uh, Don didn't really like the Cal Arts people particularly. They were not uh, subscribing to his brand of animation religion. And they were kind of, we were asking questions and he was like, you know, I don't have to answer your questions. Get out of here. <laughs> so uh, so that, that was kind of, a, uh, we had the door somewhat slammed in our face and we were not hugely supportive of him. But the first feature then after that, that I worked on was the Fox and the Hound. So you saw it in the theater. So yeah, so I, animated various things. And in the middle of the Fox and Hound, Don Bluth, who was trying to get his own studio going, did get money. And so he left. And so I wound up animating some of the scenes he would have animated. But uh, so I did stuff after the, after John Pomeroy and Don left. Um, I did scenes of the hunter, which had been John's character when he's deciding, you know, am I going to shoot the Fox or not? I animated that shot. And uh, mm -hmm. and some of the stuff in the bear fight, I worked with Glenn Keane. Glenn Keane did all this very powerful stuff with the bear, amazing stuff. And I did a couple of shots of the bear where there was a scene involving the hunter and the bear where he's scrambling for his gun and that kind of thing. But I also worked with Cliff Nordberg uh, a little bit and certainly on the small one, who was a veteran who was part of like Kimball's unit, was a very cartoony, very broad, very intuitive animator. He wasn't like Frank Thomas. You know, as in your class, you probably have people with different approaches, even, even assuming that they're trying to do character animation where you're getting personalities and thought processes even within that, there are these schools of thought, such as there's Frank, who's highly analytical and really, you know, really broke things down in terms of uh, uh, emotions and thought processes. And, and then even physically, you know, I want the over eyebrows to overlap by two frames here and they're going to start in just before this other thing happens. So I'm going to cascade and all this. Cliff Norberg was not like that. He was totally intuitive, totally a feel guy. So he would just like, he'd literally act out the scene and feel where his body was going and he would draw what his body was doing. And, uh, and that was his approach. And he, and uh, Ward Kimball, one of his words of advice to uh, Cliff, which was good advice. And he gave it to me at a certain point when I was trying to do something, he said, make sure you let the audience see the funny picture because I was doing things too fast sometimes, you know, and you get a, a, a sort of a, what should have been a tableau pose or, a, or some pose that, was funny in itself and almost like a gag. And you know, you'd race through it. No, no, no. They got to see that when they really got to see it. It's got to land and they only get one chance to see it. It's there and it's gone. So you really got to make it read. So Cliff was good that way to really pull me in to really try and get me to 
shape, shape what I was doing so that to keep an audience in mind because uh, character animation at least as, as done at Disney and, and that I like is it's done for an audience, not just for yourself. So if you don't communicate your ideas clearly, you're not doing your job. So if the audience is confused, unless you deliberately want them to feel kind of uneasy and confused, which is legitimate, but assuming you want to do something where I think they need to understand what's going on, you need to use every tool in your arsenal. How do I make it clear? How do I make it a positive statement? Eric Larson was so big on that. You know, what do you, you know, a change of shapes and arcs and silhouettes and and strong storytelling poses and timing. Uh, how do you communicate personality in a way that uh, needs no words generally? I mean, we used to do that with our, our uh, the movies that Ron and I worked on, we often, we had heard this from Chuck Jones a little bit too, but you know, you should watch it with the sound off almost and see, does it tell the story? Does the movie tell the story? Because it really is meant to be visual storytelling with dialogue and has been certainly dialogue can add a lot, but. But if you really can graphically use the film graphics that you're doing with the way the shots are staged and cut and, uh, you know, uh, poses and attitudes and acting beats so that you, and that's one of the reasons why I think as a kid, animation was so strong to me when I saw it as, you know, I saw Sleeping Beauty in the theater when I was six and I saw, um, you know, and I saw 101 Dalmatians. I don't know if I was maybe eight or something like that, but uh, in some ways animation seemed more, real to me than live action. And I think it's that way with autistic kids, you know, I think, and I'm, I don't think I'm autistic, but I think there's a way that it communicates in a very primal way because it is visual and it just doesn't depend on words so that I, and, and it involves uh, caricature, which I, I do, I do caricatures of people and that sort of thing, but caricature in the broadest sense, and the caricature is not just a bigger exaggeration of something, but it's a distillation of things. You take things, you take the, the non-essential things away and what you're left with can communicate that much more strongly. So, so I think that's what the Disney films did and, and the great animation of, in many studios. They, they take away the non-essential parts and they leave the essential and, and maybe put, you know, stage it and push it forward so that it really it can hit you in a deep way, I think. And uh, I think that's part of what sort of sucked me into the world of animation, that powerful uh, communication. Yeah, it's a universal language, right? It's it is, yeah. yeah, and it's been fun as we've done these films, you know, and we see them, we tour, and when we do these features, we go on the junkets or whatever, you know, to go to other countries, and you see them in other languages, and you get, and it's fun to, or even to, you know, we were walking down the street in another city, and you 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 see a poster for it, you, you have people reacting to a joke that you wrote in English, you know, four years ago, and uh, it is fun to. That when films last beyond, you know, the next week or whatever, and when they have a reach that credit to the Disney marketing megalopolis, you know, that they sort of could get the word out around the world and had a distribution and publicity machine mm -hmm. in all these different countries. Every country had its own sort of apparatus and they really uh, did a good job of dubbing them in these other languages and things. So yeah, it is, and Disney, that was a hallmark of Disney. You know, they made a lot of money in the early going from the markets in Europe and that sort of thing. Snow White was a huge hit around the world, so it wasn't just domestically. Mm -hmm. And then when the war came along and those markets dried up, that's when Disney got in a bad way because they were uh, reliant on those, you know, international monies. So absolutely, just like today. Um, yeah, today. So you you mentioned Ron, uh, and obviously a long-standing friendship. And well, I'm assuming you guys were friends. Um, and working partners, um, and and you know through the Great Mouse Detective, uh, Basil of Baker Street, as I knew it, um, yeah. into the Little Mermaid, which I know for uh, certainly of people of my generation was a seminal moment for me um, and for just culture. I mean, no, not not to overstate it, um, and I'm sure for you it was just making a movie, um, but certainly yeah. it had a huge huge yeah. impact on everyone. Yeah, yeah, both of those idea, both of those films came about were put forward, were pitched by Ron Clements, actually. Ron Clements, I was a big Holmes enthusiast, but Ron was a bigger Holmes enthusiast. And uh, when the studio was doing Black Cauldron, they were looking for other smaller projects that might um, occupy people that weren't happy on Black Cauldron. Sort of. So uh, Ron pitched, hey, there's a series of books by Eve Titus. And uh, they, Joe Hale, the producer of Black Cauldron, read them, he liked them, they optioned the book. And uh, so we worked on that and that was, uh, a fun project to do. And we tried, to, I, my original version of that uh, 
was a little bit more Monty Python-y in a way. And, and Ron Miller, who was in charge of the studio, uh, was a little bewildered by some of the Monty Python touches in it. So, it's, <laughs> and, and even the Goon Show, which no one in your audience will know, but the Goon Show, which was a great British radio show with Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan, which I loved and very surrealistic. And it was kind of Goon related, but we moved away from that somewhat. But yeah, it was fun to do. And uh, it was a cartoony film. And it was a chance even for somebody like Glenn Keane, who did Radigan, you know, he really did a character where he really super designed the character, supervised the character, and we really pushed forward more, which had gone away a little bit, the idea of, you know, just directing animators and working with a team of people. And even that the cleanup then would be under the auspices of that animator. They had gotten away from that somewhat with some of the new people coming in, like me, who they felt like, we've got to fix this stuff. So they, they were like, once I, once I animated, it went away, and I never saw it again until it was on the screen. That is not an ideal system, I think, but that was the system they were working on here. Um, but yes, did that. And then uh, Eisner and Katzenberg came in in the mid 80s, then from Paramount. They brought with them this technique that they used at Paramount to generate ideas called the Gong Show, based on a TV show no longer around where talent acts by for you know, the judges and you get gonged if you're not good enough. So they, they had directors and writers come in and pitch ideas for possible animated features. And we're supposed to bring in five. And one of the ones that Ron brought in was Little Mermaid. He'd gone to a bookstore and read the story. and. So, gee, this is such a cinematic, wonderful, beautiful, emotional fairy tale. Why have they never done this? And he's reading, and then he gets to the end. And, oh, I guess maybe this is why they didn't do it. I don't know, because it's a very kind of uh, somewhat tragic ending. So he came up with a different take on it a little bit and wrote a little two-page treatment that initially got gone, got rejected. But uh, because they were doing a sequel to Splash in live action at the time, and they thought, and Jeffrey Kensberg thought this sounded too much like Splash. Of course, Splash in its own way, was based on The Little Mermaid, but right. wait a minute, it's the other way around. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, fortunately, he did read Ron's treatment after rejecting it and realized it was good. And Michael Eisner, who knew Disney did fairy tales, said, no, this fairy tale, it seems kind of like a neat idea. Let's put it in development. So it did go into development back in 1986. And then Ron invited me, who I really wasn't part of that pitch, but when they were trying to write a script for it, um, they had a live action writer who was stuck and really wasn't you know, feeling it for the material. And so Ron said, I'd like to pitch you and me writing because we wrote together on uh, Great Mouse Detective. And I said, I would love to write on it. So I joined Ron and we wrote a script with fortunately, Jeff, we really loved the script. And so they kind of uh, bought the script and they said, okay, you guys are going to direct, but you got to be under contract. We hadn't been under contract at that point. We, we were just week to week employees. And then they said, if you're going to do this film, you have to say you're going to be here for the three years. It's gonna be it so, so we signed a contract and the whole deal. But yes, yeah, so we did that. And uh, while we were working on it, we were just trying to, you know, had fairy tale hadn't been done in 30 years, really, since Sleeping Beauty. And we were just trying to make a movie that we would like. We weren't targeting anybody. In fact, it threw us when we had, as we were nearing finishing the film, it was about to be shown to people. And, and Jeffrey had seen, I think, an in-house screening of it. And I think he was on the phone with Michael and telling him how it went and all that stuff. But he said to us, you know, I just want to caution you guys, you know, that this is a girl's movie. So it's not going to do as well as Oliver and Company because that's a boys movie. And boys movie, he said, it's not right, but it's just the way of the world. Boys movies do better than girls. A boy, a girl will go to a boys movie, a boy won't go to a girls movie. I, I don't know what it is. So, and I had never in all the time I worked on Little Mermaid thought of it as a girl's movie. I just, yeah. oh, it's a fairy tale. I mean, we're trying to, but I relate to the heroine and we're trying to make, you know, her emotional in a way that transcends. It's not, we're not just trying to make it for five-year-old girls or something. That ain't, we're making it for ourselves, but uh so then ironically, when we had our first previews in the, at the AMC in Burbank, uh, they did it with family audience and it, and it went really well. And they said, well, let's do it with an adult audience as well. And it went even better with an all an adult audience. And Jeffrey was just staggered by this, like, wait a minute. I mean, I mean, this could have an audience outside, just little kids and things like that. So, um, so they developed a whole other marketing campaign aimed at adults and it did cross over. It got date business and it got, you know, and so it did, on the ice, and then there was a series of films. You know, Roger Rabbit came. Actually, Roger Rabbit came before that and helped kind of broaden the audience. And uh, and then Mermaid broadened it further. And then uh, going on from that, certainly uh, Beauty and the Beast widened it further. And then we did Aladdin and bigger still. And then Lion King was after that. And so it was. Uh, yeah. you know, it, it kept expanding. And when we first started, there was sort of a stigma about animation. You know, like if you're over a certain age, you wouldn't be caught dead going to a Disney feature. And even you know, I went through that too as a kid. I didn't see a Disney feature from probably 13 until I started getting interested in animation again when I was maybe 18. So all during that, those teen years, I, I really didn't do it. And I sort of caught up to some of the films that I hadn't seen during that time. Um, but we, I think Mermaid and Aladdin and Lion King and 
Beauty and the Beast, uh, they all helped yeah. uh, remove that stigma. So you, it was okay. You didn't have to bring a kid with you to go into a theater. Well, I mean, some people still did that. Like they were so embarrassed. Like I have to bring a kid with me. I want to see it, but you know, I would be mortified if someone saw yeah. me coming out of a Disney. Oh, and, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I remember, I mean, it feels awful to say, but I remember when I saw Little Mermaid, like I, I didn't want to tell my friends that I'd seen. Yeah, the- I could imagine that. Definitely. I get it probably shifted my whole career yeah. sense you know it's I, I always like drawing but little mermaid and beauty yeah. and, the Beast and aladdin that was it i was i was off to the races the yeah. other part of little mermaid and, and aladdin beauty and the beast is obviously the, the musical side of it and i wanted to ask mm-hmm. you obviously another amazing working partnership that you were uh able to be honored to to work next to was uh alan menken and, and the great howard ashman yes that was a great fortuitous thing we we had been fans of Howard and Alan. We saw a little shop of horrors that played in LA at the Westwood Playhouse. And in fact, uh, now the Geffen Playhouse and uh, David Geffen was one of the producers of the show. And in fact, he was the guy then that, he was a friend of Jeffrey's. David Geffen was a big agent and then later became a you know, a part of uh, DreamWorks and all that and multi kazillionaire and all that sort of thing. But he, I think was telling Jeffrey, Howard Ashman is a guy you should be in business with this guy. He's sharp. He's funny. He's visual. He's he's like the next thing, next big thing. You should you should get this guy. So then Jeffrey started pursuing Howard, and I think Jeffrey really liked Little Shop as well. And so when they were pursuing Howard, they showed him a list of projects in development. And Ron had pitched Little Mermaid, and Howard looked down the list and he said, "That's the one I would like to work on." I you know I I love Hans Christian Andersen. I I wrote a musical uh, based on the Snow Queen when I was in uh, graduate school, and I. Uh, I think uh, it would be fun to do that. So the studio came to us, you know, Peter Schneider, who was running it for Jeffrey, and said, okay, you guys gonna work with Howard? And, and we said, great, we love that idea. So I had a phone call with Howard. We were gonna go visit Howard. And we we had our 10 page treatment we had written before we wrote the script and we we're gonna show that to Howard. And we uh, we uh, he, we talked to him on the phone and, and he said, now, are you thinking this movie is set in like Denmark, you know, and all that? And we said, well, it's kind of a fairy tale pastiche it's not really any historical Denmark he said because you know I'm I've got this idea that I would like the music to involve you know reggae and calypso because it feels like it fits a seaside motif and I think it's a way of making it more contemporary and more accessible and we said go for it man and then we had heard already from Peter Schneider that he said yeah Peter said you well, gotta talk to Howard it's great he's got this idea of making the crab a Rastafarian you're gonna love it go to you know like <laughs> wait a minute the crabs are we had a crab in our story who's like this stuffed shirt British guy, of course, which all British people, one of the variations is the stuffed shirt, but he was the major domo, you know, and, and very stuffy. And so when we we did it with Howard, of course, we weren't sure when we thought he's going to be a Jamaican. So we thought, are you saying you want him to be more laid back or whatever? And Howard said, no, 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 you don't get it. No, not laid back. No, I'm thinking like Jeffrey Holder, who at the time, wonderful actor, choreographer, was doing a series of commercials for 7-Up. The Ancola man, and he was very grand and very big, and ah, welcome, you know, very theatrical and grand. He said, I'm thinking more like that, that he's, you know, grand. And we said, oh, okay. So as we wrote the script, we pictured Jeffrey Holder. When we rewrote the Rich, which originally, when he read it, he said, well, I love this because it's like Dynasty. And that made me think of Joan Collins a little bit. So when I was writing the dialogue, I was sort of picturing Joan Collins. Now, Ron says when he was writing his dialogue, he was picturing B. Arthur, because we also talked about B. Arthur at the beginning as a possible voice. B. Arthur never auditioned for the part because her her agent was insulted that in the script we had said that the the witch spoke in a low B. Arthur uh, voice or something and she thought that was an insult so so she would not even show it to B. Arthur I will not you know darken her door with this script so so we couldn't get B. Arthur so anyway uh, but we were very happy with Pat Carroll we we were lucky that we got Pat Carroll so yes it was a very but it was a very tense movie to make in a way you know you look at oh it's fun 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 but. You know, we're always getting yelled at about spending too much money, taking too much time, <laughs> and we didn't know if it would work. You know, and we're you don't we don't show it publicly really until these previews a few months before it comes out, and when it's not quite too late to do anything, but you can't do much at that point. So it was a very much a relief when we showed those previews, and wow, it suddenly was going over great, and you know, and and uh, it was amazing, really. So uh, it was it was a relief, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then on your next film, talk about collaborative uh relationships and, and voice talent you worked with yeah amazing. working with rob and yeah, the other great rob rob. Williams. Well, that was it was our pitch to use rob and we we uh we howard had actually developed aladdin before we got to it but then his version kind of ran aground they were jeffrey didn't like it that much and it was uh it had uh an african-american genie they had fats waller music it was sort of a hope crosby 
30s pastiche, you know, campy musical. And that didn't, Je Jeffrey wanted, I think, an epic, you know, Lawrence of Arabia kind of uh, Arabian <laughs> fantasy, sort of. Uh, but we liked Howard's idea. So we thought there was a way to kind of merge the epic approach with Howard's, uh, you know, Fats Waller genie. Although we thought he doesn't have to be African American. What if we made him Robin? Because Robin is so mercurial. We could do something in animation. I would say that's one of our general things we tried to do in all our films. It's like, and it's harder to do nowadays than it was 40 years ago or 30 years ago, but sort of like, what can we do in animation that really exploits the animation medium and that, you know, you can't do as easily in live action. Now, I, I would maintain your honor that uh, as wonderful as Robin has been in many things, and I think he's a great live action actor, that we were able to do things with him that he couldn't do in live action. I mean, we could do, you know, Eric Goldberg did these amazing mercurial shifts and yet it was in character, it was funny. And yet we tried to keep an emotional core to it. So as much as he got, and Robin was the same way. He would free, free will improv, but he, in doing the scenes as he recorded them, he had a sense of how they fit in the story. He would bring it back to what the emotional truth of it was while still going to the stratosphere with his improvs. Um, and yeah, he was just so hardworking, such a great collaborator. We'd throw ideas at him. He'd be in the booth and say, how about trying it this way? How about trying it that way? And he'd say, okay, yeah, wait, 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 let me try this. And then he'd keep going. He would just run and run and run and run and sweat. And, and uh, he was just a blast to work with. And then we would pick through, you know, the hours of material, you know, we, the, the scene that started out as two minutes was now 12 minutes long. And, and me and Eric Goldberg, Ron and I, Eric Goldberg would sit and everything he said was transcribed and we had it written down and we'd individually listen to it separately and circle the things we liked. And we came back together and compared notes and then saw where we overlapped and the ideas. And, and so then we had the editor, H. Lee Peterson made sort of a reel that was still too long, but shorter than the 12 minutes. And then out of that, we shortened it still. And we wrote new intros and outros as he had suggested things that demanded other lines. And uh, it was built sort of that way. And it was just, uh, again, but it was walking off a cliff a little bit again, because Beauty and the Beast was being worked on at the time. It was having these previews at the Toronto Film Festival. Like, we're in tears. We love it. In fact, this weekend was the 30th anniversary of its, you know, inception or its release. And um, and but we knew, you know, we're not doing Beauty and the Beast. We're doing a comedy. This is a comedy, and it breaks the fourth wall. We have people looking at the audience, you know, and stuff like that. We were breaking a bunch of rules, and some people in house didn't like what we were doing. Some people were saying, "You guys are pulling the entire Disney organization down with this movie, and you're." You're kind of betraying the roots of animation and it's insincere and it's this and that. And it's gonna, it's not gonna stand the test of time. It's too topical and all this. And like, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> and then we we pursued our approach and uh, Jeffrey supported our approach. I mean, we also had, you know, it was a war in, in Iraq at the time, you know, and while we were making the movie, and we we're like, holy mackerel, are we gonna keep making this movie while there's this war? It's just starting to unfold, you know. And, yeah. and Jeffrey, to his Winston Churchill like credit, he kind of was, damn it, you know, we're going to we're going to press ahead and we're not going to let world events influence. We're going to make this movie. And, and so because I, I was wondering and we were at a big town hall meeting, Jeffrey, someone raised the question to Jeffrey and he got up and said, no, we're, we're going to we're going to do it. We're going to do it carefully and thoughtfully, but we're, we're proceeding. And they wow. did. And they never blinked. And uh, I'm happy they didn't. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I mean, your body of work here is I mean, we could spend hours on this, but I did want to ask you a question because the students watch this film a couple of weeks ago, Treasure Planet, yeah. which speaking of, you know, things not necessarily going easily, this was a movie that was pitched back in the 80s and finally got made, you know, 20 years later almost. Yeah, it was pitched by Ron again, Ron the master pitch guy. Same meaning he pitched Little Mermaid. He pitched Treasure Island in Space, as it was called. <laughs> and it got gonged then when he pitched it because they said, no, nope, that's the plot of the next Star Trek movie. And he said, and Ron, who's more of a fan of Star Trek than I am, certainly, said that wasn't the next Star Trek movie. So whatever it was in development, it moved way away from that. But be that as it may, we had a hard time selling Jeffrey Katzenberg on the idea. He didn't like science fiction. The character of Long John Silver, he didn't get, yada, yada. So it took forever to get off the ground. And finally, it was really Jeffrey leaving. Actually, Jeffrey sort of went along with, he said, after you do Hercules, you can do it. But, uh, but then he left during uh, Hercules because he went to start DreamWorks. And Michael Eisner, eager to keep talent and how said, Let's do Treasure Planet. So, so uh, we said yes, good idea. So we we embarked on that, and yeah, it was it was not a musical. It was an action adventure. It was a coming of age story. It had a male protagonist. It had some dark elements. It had a kind of gray, conflicted, funny, but is he a good guy or bad guy? Character in Long John Silver. So, 
things that were, you know, outside, if you said there's a template for the Disney musical, there were, you know, eight things that were not within that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we made it and not only that, but we first previewed it, uh, it was maybe like a, a month after 9-11 happened. Right. And we're, and we're doing a, and we're showing a preview. And so it, we're, we're dying even as we're going to the preview because here comes the audience into the preview and stereotypically, whatever, moms and little girls, all coming into the theater. Like, I mean, it's meant to be a little broader audience. So this is actually adventure. Anyway, um, you know, the preview didn't go great. And there were issues because 9-11 with people mutinying and taking over a vessel with sharp objects. And it was just, and we had to, it met a lot of different things. Plus, Roy Disney and Michael Eisner at that point were feuding. They were not, they who had been getting along very well before that were now not getting along at all. And Roy was very upset with Michael, feeling like he was making a lot of bad decisions. And Michael was like, I want Roy, you know, away from me and I don't want to have to deal with Roy. And so Treasure Planet in some ways became in the middle of this divorce between Roy and, and Michael a little bit. I mean, I do think for the reasons that I said, it was a tough sell to an audience at that time. And uh, uh, and I still, I like the movie and I know there's been this audience of 20 somethings and whatever that really loved the movie. And I'm very happy for that. And I still love the movie, but it did not reach a wide audience. And in fact, the studio wrote it off after the first weekend. We're like, please don't. And it's like, no, it's done. But I think that was partly because Michael wanted Roy to look as bad as possible so that he could put him away so he could make the decisions he wanted to without his interference. So You're just a so I'm, happy, I'm happy that we made it, but it was, and, and it was un, under this cloud of the movies are getting more expensive. Pixar was doing really well. Now DreamWorks was about to do CG. Mm -hmm. Is it all going to be CG anyway? Are we ever even going to do 2D anymore? And this is an expensive, you know, hybrid movie where we were doing a lot of CG with the hand-drawn and a lot of things came together in a, in a less than ideal way. So yeah, so we, in the wake of Treasure Planet, we were very much in Michael Eisner's doghouse and, you know, we fixed other ideas to him and we had a very hard time because he hated most things we pitched to him in the wake of Treasure Planet's, uh, you know, nice. uh, failure at the box office. It was not, not a real happy time for us. Mm -hmm. But you did have a, your, your sort of last few years had a... Well, we did. A and actually, John, you know, we were really, we were on the verge of leaving Disney because Michael basically said, you know, you don't have to be exclusive to Disney anymore. We'll pay you a lot less money, so you don't have to be exclusive, and <laughs> uh, and you can shop around. So we did, and we were on the verge of signing to do a film that never got made. I think by uh, Stars, I think it was Janet Healy, and uh, we were just on the verge of doing it when when the Pixar Disney merger happened, and we heard, "Don't sign anything. Something's going down." So we sort of held back from signing up to do that. And then that happened, and uh, you know, and we had uh, you know dinner with Ed Catmull and he was like, yeah, you know, me and John Lester would love you to come back to the studio and make a film there. And we said, we would love to also. So we came back to the studio. So we were only out for a couple of months and they kind of grandfathered our time. So, so I think we were out for maybe five months in 2005, I think it was. And then, so we pitched a lot of ideas to John and among them, uh, one of the ideas that had been developed in-house and at Pixar was a movie based on the, the Frog Prince. Uh, they were working on a Pixar, and Disney was working on a version. So John said, can you guys take a look at that? And we did. And uh, Disney was already exploring the idea of doing it with a new, or actually both studios, crazily enough, I think, had explored the idea of a New Orleans setting for the thing independently of each other. And we liked that idea, but we had other ideas. The, and so we, and we suggested Randy Newman doing the music. Anyway, we pitched a, a, a totally sort of different take on the movie. And uh, John really liked it. And he said, you guys got to go to New Orleans, which we did. And we met you know, a voodoo priestess, and we met a wonderful raconteur who had stories in New Orleans, and we saw the scene there and with food and music and all of that. And, and we had a tour of the bayou by a Cajun ship captain named Reggie, who was a riot, very funny guy. And so he became kind of the basis of Ray, animated by Mike Surrey, noted Canadian. And right. uh, so uh, it was, it, so yeah, so it went really well. And we were doing a hand-drawn film, you know, John loved hand-drawn and and we got to bring some people back in Yauza in Canada, you know, did a lot of the cleanup was done yeah, in Canada really and uh, uh, with the Chasson brothers and all that. Um, so yeah, it was really fun to work on and John was good to work with and, yeah. and people were very collaborative and it was a, really a fun environment to be working on that film. And then after that, yes, we, uh, we, we were working on another project for a while where that fell apart because it was based on a book that we couldn't get the rights to. 
So we worked like a year on a project that didn't quite get made. And then uh, we had to pitch some new ideas. And among them, I pitched the idea of doing a, uh, I wanted, I was concerned trying to do something in Polynesia. I just thought it was a great arena and uh, I, it hadn't really been done. And I, it prompted me to read, I, I wasn't aware. I thought, are there Polynesian myths and things like that? So I dug into the research and I discovered there's a huge wealth of Polynesian mythology. Mm. And I learned about the character of Maui, whom I hadn't known about before, who was a shapeshifter and he had a magical fish hook and he could pull up islands out of the sea. And uh, just all these things, he's like bigger life than a character and a man of the people and all this. And I'm like, this is so great. So I went in, I should, Ron didn't know anything about Maui either. So I showed him the research and the myths and he read about that and he loved that. And, uh, and then John Laster, as he does in my list, thinks, hey, you guys really got to, this is great, but you got to dig into the research more. We pitched a version that was sort of built around Maui, and we cobbled together a few myths that were really Hawaiian in origin. And then we went then on a research trip to Samoa and uh, Tahiti and uh, um, Samoa, Tahiti and Fiji. And we, we, uh, and we learned a ton of stuff. We met people that are the team we put together, Maggie Malone and Jessica Julius did an amazing job of connecting us with people who were tied into the culture. And they really communicated very strongly to us. You gotta do something that respects the culture and that we like, and that we feel that, you know, it embraces this amazing culture we have that is built on navigation, that Polynesians were the greatest navigators in the world, you know, mm -hmm. it was dead reckoning to find their way across the ocean. We loved all that. We got to sail with the Fijian fishermen who talked about the ocean like it was alive. And, and Ron and I independently, we wrote notes up after me and said, the ocean has to be a character in this movie. You know, we have to make the ocean care. We can do that in animation, let's do that. And, uh, and we, I did some sketches when I was there and we came back and really reworked the story completely. We pitched to people what we had learned and everybody was just, ah, this is these lessons, you know, about interconnectivity and reciprocity and uh, knowing your mountain. If you don't know your mountain, you don't know who you are. And just all these great sort of life lessons. And, uh, we tried to get that into the movie then. And the movie evolved hugely. I mean, we were we had a different version of the story and we were struggling and we had different writers. Ultimately, Jared Bush came on and really helped us out enormously and helped kind of trip the story as did Chris Williams, Canadian, and uh, uh, Don Hall. And uh, so they really helped set the story straight where we were, they, we had essential ideas that were still in there, but we were wobbling around trying to get it to work and they really helped get it to work. Yeah, what a great film. I mean, I, I remember getting a tour of the new, like, renovated Disney studio, and it was like Mark Henn and Malcolm Pierce in a corner working on this character named Moana. And it was yeah. just, like, you got this little tease, and it's like, wow, this movie is really, really well researched. And of course, you know, the, the, that movie and Princess and the Frog, great, strong, modern female representation. Yeah, it was really, yeah, we really wanted to do that, you know, and to, the idea when Prince and the Frog that, you know, she was, uh, she had a job, you know, and she was trying to make a restaurant, a go of a restaurant. And she, you know, looked up to her father, but who had this dream of this restaurant and, and uh, grounded in some real life issues and deal with race, but deal with it in a, you know, try and thread. It was a challenge, you know, to try and thread a path through different obstacles. Yeah. Um, and then on, on Moana, yeah, it was, uh, you know, we had an all Polynesian voice, mostly Polynesian voice cast, I think almost everyone. And uh, and they gave us good notes during the production. Maui in our original version, he had, uh, he was bald because Sue Nichols, great Sue Nichols, did a drawing him that I really liked where he was bald. And so for a long time he was bald. And of course the rock is bald, but our first trip to the islands, uh, one of our advisors said, if you do Maui, he's gotta have long hair. And, and our Tahitian advisor when we saw them later said, yeah, his mana, you know, his mana, his power, it's." It's in his hair, partly, you know. So, so we said, okay, even though it's a huge production issue, he's going to have a heck of a head of hair. And so, and maybe we had people developing new tools to do the hair. So, I think we had the best hair, at least to that point, between Moana and Molly, where all this great overlap and life and digital hairspray, so they'd keep it from going in her face when she was moving, you know, and all that stuff. So, uh, it was really, yeah. And, and for us, we didn't know anything about CG, so they gave us tutorials. Steve Goldberg, the great Steve Goldberg, was really the the you know, the VFX supervisor on Frozen sort of gave us, this is how the jobs compare 2D to CG. This is the pipeline. And we discovered how iterative the CG pipeline is and how much more of a zigzag the path is, that there's things that aren't really finished and you're working on a bunch of things at one time and uh, you're not seeing the final version of a lot of stuff till further down the line. So you have to kind of take it on faith a little bit in a way that you don't on 2D where it goes department, department, department. So, uh, 
So we would go to these daily sessions where we'd say, they'd show us a scene of animation, you know, and we'd say, okay, uh, and it would be in a rough form. We'd say, okay, now the, the you know, the trees back there. No, no, forget the trees. They would say, the trees are placeholders. They, you don't worry about the trees. They look like trees, but those are just stuck in there. Okay, okay. And, and the sky, no, 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 no. That's the sky we pulled from another scene. No, no, no. And we're like, yeah, okay. And then we'd start to think we had the hang of it. Say, so we can, we can ignore the rocks down at the bottom of the screen. And they'd say, well, no, those are the real rocks. And so we'd be like, ah, how do we? So we always had someone who was guiding us like the blind man through the process to tell us, look at that, don't look at that. And, um, you know, great heads of animation, Amy Smead and Aaron Mosman. We delegated more on that film. All, every other film in a way, we were the heads of animation. We saw every animator and all that. And, and now we had head, heads of animation. So they were showing scenes to other people before we saw them, which was a big deal for us. Cause like, oh, we were, we were both animators and we're connected to the process. And now we're gonna see some of that, but it worked very well. They, they did an amazing job and the quality of the animation was just uh, off the charts, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Got a couple of, of questions here from the audience. I'm going to paraphrase some of these because there's, there's there's quite a few questions here. And we don't have seven hours, um, mm -hmm. but I do I do have one final question for you that I'm going to pin for later, which is related to something that someone asked here. But I did want to ask you about you know you made that transition from animator to director of 2D films and then to a 3D film, which you know the the story experience you have would just transfer over. But the question here is where where do you think animation is going next, you know, uh, you've got this legacy behind yeah, you. Where, yeah. where do you think the next 40 years of animation is gonna go? I don't know. I know there's this whole thing with VR and all that. I don't really know if VR will turn into something that, you know, can really be interactive in a way. I, I feel like anything that allows the, star, the, the audience to tell you what the story is, automatically can't work. I think so so I'm, I'm not the biggest fan, although I think the immersive nature of it. So I think, I think movies will continue to get more and more immersive. I think that's, Natural. And of course, that leads lends itself to more CG than it does 2D. Mm -hmm. I still love 2D. I do think it's been a, a good thing. I feel like uh, the streaming service is getting into animation because I feel like it's just produced a lot more uh, places to shop your wares. If you're an artist, if you have a story you want to tell. I mean, when I started Disney, Disney was the only place doing feature like films. If you wanted to make a animated feature if you didn't do it at disney there was literally almost nowhere else that's right. not healthy for the artists it's not healthy for the business and for the audience i think it's good for the audience to have choices of what they want to do so i'm i'm encouraged actually i think by uh the way animation is sort of fanned out into the streaming world and i think that's going to continue to happen and i think there's going to be hits and misses now it's very the weird thing is i don't totally know you know like is it it was easier to codify when things are in the theater okay this made this amount of money it had reached now there are, I think they do know in these streaming services how many hits how many eyeballs they're reaching they don't share that I think that may change and you may get more of a sense of you know because there have been a number of animated features that have played even over the last six months on on streaming services mm. and did how did they do I mean did people have they moved into the zeitgeist I mean in a way that more than box office or anything it's a feeling like did it you know when we first started working at Disney when we worked on the Fox and the Hound we went to a restaurant you know it was after the Fox and the Hound came out and this waitress said oh you guys work at disney he said and she said yeah what you know what are you what are you working on and so we just finished the fox and she said, yeah i never heard of that and <laughs> and i think that was very discouraging to us you know and the idea that again the stigma thing but um i feel um that with these streamers and that sort of thing that there's opportunities for sort of niche animation you know that you can if you do it a little more cheaply perhaps that you can do something that's you know doesn't try to hit every but you know every every uh, focus group or something like that. You may be able to do animation that is either more adult nature. You could do a horror film in animation. You could do mm -hmm. this or that. It does, it could be if if it's done more cheaply, it might be animation that uh, is not where kids are not the main part of the audience or even a part of the audience perhaps. So I, I think that's possible. That may happen. I don't know though because it's the 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 field of the box office is littered with people's attempts at times to do something. Uh, that was, you know, uh, a more adult sort of film or something like that, just in, in terms of its content or storytelling approach. Um, and you you have experience in that with with audience returning to a film like Princess and the Frog or Treasure Planet years later and getting finally. Yeah, I think there's been rediscovery of certain films and things like that. And even I mean, Brad, you know, Killer for Brad, Iron Giant, you know, it's one yeah. of the family films. Warner Brothers totally messed up the marketing of the movie and it was a challenging thing to sell and they didn't sell it. So it's, 
this great thing. But I, and I think it's been much more found on video as these things happen, you know, where people, and, and even with Moana, I think I discovered, uh, it seemed to me, at least just this, my own reading of it, that as great as it did in the theaters and all that stuff, when it went to the stream, when it went to Netflix, the audience ballooned out that much more. So, which is one of the reasons why when Disney pulled their content from Netflix, I think they said, we got to have animation on our service. It's part of our footprint. It's part of how we get, you know, subscribers. So they're spending billions of dollars on animation uh, to keep keep it going. It's a you know, maw that's always gobbling through material. So good in that sense that it, there's an appetite for it, I think. And I think there are, obviously there's students. I, you know, the idea, it's, it's a question with 2D, you know, what is the future of 2D? I mean, obviously, Sergio did a great, wonderful film, I thought, in Klaus, Sergio Pablos. And I have no idea how that really did, you know, and, and, it, um, and what it cost and how they feel. They got, do they get the return on what it cost? Yeah. And I don't know if Sergio, do you know is Sergio doing another one? I hope so. But uh, I think he is. But uh, I, I really hope hand drawn continues. And I, we always said, you know, it's like uh, different tools in a paint box. You know, there's things you can do in hand drawn. It's like sculpture and painting. It isn't, sculpture isn't better than painting and live action isn't better than animation. They're different things. And so I, I hope. My hope is that the audio, you know, that the film world can be broad enough to include, you know, cut on animation and stop motion and and things. Yeah, like we say, that maybe in terms of the immersive things, where it'll be even more and more immersive. And there's going to be ways of doing the sound and the picture and the way it's projected and all that. That's it's going to really be all around you and all that. I, I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I think people are going to keep pushing that, and it's going to be a good thing. I think. I think I think the exciting thing is it can be anything now. There's that's the potential. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of walls that sort of got knocked down by one film or another, and it still takes people that are you got to you know get some people in the financial world that are willing to take a certain amount of risk. But it helps if you can minimize their risks or find a way that they can cushion their risk, you know, so that it isn't just a some altruistic thing. Generally, the people with the kind of money to make these films are not altruistic. They, they want to see a profit at the other end. <laughs> they have their but, own but through the course, but that was the client, that was the story of, you know, the old Hollywood system. And yet they made, you know, Grapes of Wrath and Gone with the Wind, whatever, you know, they, they made classic The Wizard of Oz and, and uh, Double Indemnity and films that uh, have stood the test of time as both works of popular art and uh, high art, if you want to call it. That. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Got a couple time for a couple more questions, John. This this one's quite interesting. I'm going to paraphrase it from from Barbara Barbara Bueno. Sorry, um, it's an interesting question about. Do you have any advice for students that doesn't relate to art? You know, these, these are going to be production artists, people working with yeah. other teams. What, you're, you've been in the position of leadership. Yeah. Maybe some advice that doesn't involve drawing well. Um, I would say animation is such a collaborative medium. It helps to develop the skills. It's really just your communication skills, being able to express yourself verbally, what is in your head. And it, obviously even drawing wise, if you can, if even if you can, if you're in a CG movie and that sort of thing, if you can put down on a piece of paper, what is in your head that gets you a step ahead of certain other people and just puts the idea out there. But I think it's important to learn how to play well with others. I mean, you know, there, I think there are certain auteurs or people that, you know, I've worked with some people that didn't play well with others. And, uh, they don't always get hired for the next film with that sort of thing. So I think you are more marketable and you'll have a better time and you'll be part of the team. I think if you can learn to, uh, to, you know, develop those skills that help you to do that. Also, I would say one of the things that it's good for you to develop is the ability to not get too defensive and to take constructive criticism. And even if it's destructive criticism, you hear it and you can, pull out of that what you might and then set it aside but you've got to be willing to show your work and let your work be because your work will always be reviewed by other people it's part of the process and you have to be to a certain extent okay with that and hopefully learn from that and it can be tough medicine at times you know because you you can't you're you lose your objectivity quickly to your own work whether or not even it's just the quality of work you're doing in a produ production job maybe it doesn't involve any sort of drawing or anything like that just how are you with follow-up how are you with communicating to the people on your team, how are you with uh, just basic civility <laughs> or or whatever it might be, or clarity or, or uh, punctuality, any of those things. Um, so it's it's good to develop those skills and 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 be kind, be nice to other people while you're you're at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my last uh, my last question for you, John, is kind of related to that. Uh, you've now retired from directing at Disney, um, 
and you're working on your own film, uh, mm. which is kind of like a, almost like a return back to your Cal Arts days. It is. It is a weird thing. I'm going backwards. It's back to the future. You know, it's back to the past. I'm. That's right. You know, I'm working on the flux capacitor, and uh, there you go. Bumped yeah. your head in the toilet. Yeah. Um, yes. I all the time I was working at Disney, you know, I worked on these big features, which took, which took three or four years to animate. Now, of course, I'm working on a short that's hand drawn that I'm doing all the animation myself and it's taking three or four years to animate. What happened? I thought these were supposed to be faster, but uh, it is slowed a bit by uh, me trying to do the whole thing myself. So, but uh, yeah, I have, I have wonderful, talented cleanup artists and layout artists and background painters and compositors who are helping me get this, but it is a little cartoon. It's a three and a half minute short. It's based on a song that I licensed. I started out as an animator. I animated for about five years ago, about 35 years ago, but I have I have like a dozen different short films I would like to do. And I just, as much creative freedom as I had at Disney, I, I am enjoying the idea of just, I don't have to show it to anybody. If I like it this way, I'm going to leave it that way. Yeah. But I still, I'm still getting input on things, but I, I, but there are quirky things in this that, you know, I don't, I don't want to put in front of a committee and have them voted, you know, yay or nay. Right down and my original idea was then I would make these films. And if I can enter it in a festival or two here and there, and, if it gets accepted, uh, then maybe I'd go to that festival here and there and maybe talk about it or whatever. Now COVID has happened. I started this project before there was COVID. That's how long it's taken. Um, but I'm still hoping by the time I finish it, which I'm hoping sometime next year, that I really hope I can, I would still like to go to some online, I mean, some in-person festivals and show it and, and hear an audience react to it. You know, I, I yeah. the idea of releasing it online and then I hear about it later, oh yeah, I thought that was good. It's like, uh, I mean, I, it may come to that, but I'm hoping that I can see the movie in, in you know in, in the theater with nights because that's yeah. the essential experience for me. But yes, it's been fun. It's been hard work, uh, and uh, I'm learn relearning. And I've got my you know my Eric Goldberg crash course on animation book and my Preston Blair, and then uh, you know trying to figure out how do you do this again. And uh, uh, it's been fun though, and it is a cartoony cartoon. It's very slight. It's nothing. It is not going to fix any cure any diseases or have any great social message it's just kind of a cartoon so it, i hope people like it really is meant to celebrate hand-drawn animation it really is you know it's got squash and stretch and humor i think and uh dance and music and uh and just have fun with the medium of animation which drew me to it in the first place so i'm hoping this is kind of in a way a valentine toward uh hand-drawn animation awesome well we're all excited to see it john and my my final question for you then is, you know, with all this experience behind you, what's yeah. the what's the biggest challenge to doing a project like this? Having, I mean, it would be crass to say it's just an easy thing for you to step into and make a little three minute film. What's the what are the biggest challenges you're finding just working on your own? Yeah, well, I mean, everything? I'm trying to have to strike a balance between, you know, still having a home life and not being totally obsessed by it, <laughs> and and. I want to get it done though. I don't want to, you know, I'm going to, I'm not like Dick Williams. I don't want to spend 25 years on anything. I mean, as it is, this is taking longer than I thought. So I'd say getting it done is a challenge. Um, yeah. Keeping all the balls in the air. I'm like kind of my own production manager on this one. So I've got to, you know, get the work to the cleanup room and I've got to make sure the background painters got something to do. And then I've got to, so I never had to really do that. There are people who are really good at that, who did that. And that job falls to me now, just sort of managing that. And I appreciate more than ever how good those people were that I worked with at Disney who, who got it all, you know, made sure the things were there for the people who needed them when they needed them. So I'd say that's been a challenge. And then the, the actual animation itself, it's been, it really has been a fun learning process at times where I animate a scene and I'm like, what is wrong with this? There's something wrong. And I'm, and I, it helps to kind of go back and come and look at it later. And I realize, and I, in general, I would say I'm still doing what I did originally where I'm finding I have to simplify certain things, you know, where I just, there's too many ideas in the shot. You know, I've got to sort of boil, throw some out. We these things that, you know, are basic animation things, but I'm like, too many things, two things are happening at the same time. Da, da, da. And in fact, I still think I've winnowed a lot of those out. And I'm sure I'm going to show it to people like, it's too busy. You've got too many things happening at the same time. So uh, I'd say that's an ongoing challenge. And um, and fortunately, the, you know, the, the name of my production company, anyway, my drawings are very rough and loose. And thank God the cleanup people I've got are, are <laughs> because they're, they're saving my neck and I really appreciate what they're doing, but it's, it's been fun. Amazing. Well, it sounds like it's gone full circle from the advice you got um, on yeah. Fox and the Hound to keep it, to keep it simple. Yeah, um, right. Still it's 40 years later, having that challenge. I hear those same voices in my head. I'm hearing voices. Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not it's not just it uh, me it must uh, be me yes okay yeah <laughs> Amazing. Well, this has been a fantastic talk, John. We really appreciate you accepting. Yes, and, yeah, my shout out to the students there. Good luck with your films. Not you are the future of the industry, all you students. And I, I really have a lot of faith in you guys, even though I can't see any of you. But I, <clears throat> but I sense, I sense your talent through the through the cyber. I, I can feel the creative energies uh, uh, emanating from here. But no, genuinely, I, uh, I wish you well. It was a fun. You know, when I when I, uh, Chuck Jones, when he spoke at Northwestern. When I, I heard him, uh, even before I heard him at Cal Arts, he came to an animation festival there. And he was about six, in his early 60s at the time. I just had my birthday the other day. I turned uh, 68, is it? Yeah, 68. And, uh, uh, but Chuck made it seem like even at his ripe old age, he was still learning things in animation and that it wasn't a, a job by rote and that it was, uh, it was still fun and still a challenge for him. And I thought hearing him as a 20 year old, uh, that's kind of a cool job to have a job where you could be 60 and feel like I'm still learning things. And, yeah. and I'm here to tell you from the other end of Chuck Jones, you know, now uh, he was right. And I, and I've, I've been very lucky to have embarked on this uh, career. And I wish you all, well, you young students who decide to stay with them, whatever direction you may go, whether you go games, you go fine art, you go uh, whatever online things, TV, movies, interactive uh, VR, um, there's a lot of different ways you can go, and uh, and I, I'm excited for you, and I and I hope uh, you work hard. Though work hard, take criticism, and uh, and have fun. Have fun, amazing, and you too, John. Uh, yeah. All the best of luck to you on your film. Uh, I'm I'm sure we will see you. Yes, in when I finish it, I'll Park. probably come up to your school and try and get somebody to watch it if I can find enough people that are willing to watch it. Yeah, I'm there. We'll, okay. we'll reserve a theater for it right now. It's, it's okay. Hilarious. You're on. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Amazing. Thanks so Thank much. You, Max. Max behind the scenes. And uh, Max and our events team. Great job again. Uh, uh, and this will be recorded and up on YouTube uh, in the magical ways that that happens. All right. And Mark Podliner in your class. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks again, John. Thanks everyone for joining this evening. Be safe, be kind, as John said, and uh, we'll see you down the road soon. Bye everybody. See you.